Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. It's not too much of an exaggeration to say that things with George Lazenby went... almost excruciatingly bad. Regardless of what you think about on Her Majesty's Secret Service and Lazenby's performance, the actor's behaviour on and off set caused great consternation with the film's producers, and public reception to him when the film was released was tepid at best. Combined this with the fact that Lazenby took on the advice of his obviously not very good agent to dump 007 after just the one film meant that the Australian actor sauntered off, leaving behind an unsigned contract for seven films. This never happened to the other fella. So now the series was without a star again, and the producers had to wrangle a fresh one from scratch. Some fairly suspect names that are often banded around as considerations around this point include Adam West, Burt Reynolds, and Michael Gambon. But John Gavin was the one signed to play the part, and based on what I've seen of Gavin's work, he's more wooden than George Lazenby, so it's a relief that execs at United Artists stepped in and demanded that the original star, Sean Connery, be brought on board, even if it meant having to raid Fort Knox to find the cash to pay him. There's a very conscious attempt to try and recreate the success of Goldfinger, not only by bringing back the star, the director, and the singer, um, but also just in tone. There's an overall much more lighter tone here than what we found in the previous installment of the series, but does it work? Or would it have been better if Peter Hunt and George Lazenby had stuck around for another adventure? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today, folks, as we cover Diamonds Are Forever. So if, after the brutal and sombre ending of Majesties in which Bond's wife is murdered, you thought that the follow-up would be a gritty revenge story with Bond going after Blofeld and Irma Bunt hell-bent on retribution, you will be very disappointed. In fact, the very first shot of the film could have served to remove Majesties from continuity entirely as we open in Japan, which is of course where the previous Connery Bond film was set. I wouldn't read too much into that though, it's firmly established in the Moore era that the wedding definitely happened and that up until Daniel Craig, all the actors are playing the same man in a non-linear timeline. Anyway, the pre-credit sequence concerns itself with showing us Bond punching people around the world in pursuit of Blofeld. There's something of a build-up to Connery's reveal but they just largely carry on with it. There isn't a whole lot of fanfare, and indeed this delivery of his introductory line is very, very odd. Who are you? My name is Bond. James Bond. It sounds weird and sped up or something. I mean, it's odd because it sounds perfectly good in the trailer. My name is Bond. James Bond. But also quite jarring is just how much Sean Connery has aged in a short space of time since Yun lived twice. It's definitely the same old Connery though, up to his classic tricks of being violent towards women. <laughs> We cut away from Bond for a moment to be introduced to our new Blofeld, this one played by Charles Gray. It's just a jump to the left. Put your hands on your hips. This is somewhat inexplicable casting. Don't get me wrong, I love me some Grey, but based on the previous two Blofelds, he's very much the odd one out. Uh, also baffling is that the guy already had a memorable role in the previous Connery Bond movie. I think we can assume he was good friends with the Broccolis as well as probably being quite cheap to hire, and with Connery costing around an astronomical for the time $1.25 million, I don't suppose we can blame the producers for cutting costs wherever possible. So Blofeld is creating doubles of himself, by way of mashed potato baths by the looks of it, but Bond of course infiltrates and comes face to face with Blofeld once again in a moment lacking any real emotion. Making mud pies, 007. Given that Blofeld was, in part, responsible for Tracy's death in the previous film, it's a shame that this moment doesn't mean more, but I suppose that the filmmakers just kind of want to carry on and have us forget about the previous installment altogether. Curiously, also, there is no Irma Bunt around, which is especially curious, as she was the one wielding the gun that actually shot Tracy dead. Um, so I guess she got away with murder, and is one of the very few Bond villains to still be at large. Any tension or gritty revenge emotion is quite undermined by Connery's lackadaisical and curiously camp performance here. Don't get me wrong, it's a self-contained thing, this is fine. It just can be somewhat jarring when viewed in a close proximity with Majesties. Anyway, Bond and Blofeld have a very awkward, poorly edited fight, which ends with Bond sending the villain to his end. Of course, we know already that Blofeld has been creating doubles of himself, so it's fairly easy to work out that this isn't the real Blofeld, and given Grey's prominent 
Billing, he will presumably reappear later on, but whatever. Welcome to hell, Blofeld. After a lovely song and title sequence, we're back in England as Emma signs Bond the task of infiltrating a diamond smuggling ring by going undercover. I like that Bond is actually kind of sniffy about the mission. He sees it as being beneath him, and I guess after volcano lairs and angels of death, it's certainly less stakesy. This scene where Bond is briefed on diamonds is very similar to the corresponding scene in Goldfinger, but it does have some nice snippy back and forth banter between Bond and M. Pity about your liver, sir. It's an unusually fine Solera. 51, I believe. There is no year for sherry, 007. I was referring to the original vintage on which the sherry is based, sir. 1851. Meanwhile, we're cutting uh, between a lot of parallel scenes as the diamond smuggling operation is being described, and we're introduced to Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd, played by Bruce Glover and Putter Smith, respectively. It becomes clear very quickly that these two killers are bumping off everyone who handles the diamonds on the chain, and that they're also a couple. These guys are just an absolute highlight of the film. They're just so creepy, and Bruce Glover's line deliveries are just so delightful. Uh, and for a film in 1971, their presentation as a gay pair hasn't really aged all that badly, I don't think. Now, I'm certainly no social justice warrior by any stretch, but yeah, I don't think there's anything overtly offensive about Wint and Kid, how they're presented here. I mean, they are creepy killers who just so happen to be a couple, and that's it, really, and I think that's fine. I mean, this is Bond, for goodness sake. They, I think we should admire the restraints that the writers had in not calling them Mr. Top and Mr. Bottom. I love how much personality all these diamond smugglers have, by the way, to say they're not really in the film all that much. I especially love the Julie Andrews of crime here. Where to this time? Amsterdam. Amsterdam! Oh, how lovely! I shall have to bring back some pictures of the canals for the children. Bond assumes the identity of smuggler Peter Franks, who is detained at the Channel Crossing, and we have an absolutely delightful scene here with Miss Moneypenny. What can I bring you back from Holland? A diamond? In a ring? Would you settle for a tulip? Yes. For reasons, we have several gratuitous shots of the hovercraft that Bond uses to travel to Amsterdam, where he meets another smuggler, Tiffany Case, played by Jill St. John. Some really nice dialogue during this scene. In fact, if I had to make a broad comment, I'd say that the dialogue for this film is really very sharp and witty. This is the first of three films in the series to be written by Tom Mankiewicz, and he certainly has a great talent for dialogue. Speaking of dialogue, want to see Sean Connery attempt an accent that isn't British? You are English? Yes, I'm English. I speak English. I wish Connery's Bond assumed a foreign character more than he does. There's some of his absolute highlights for me. But anyway, no time for frivolity. The real Peter Franks has turned up, prompting a really well-staged fight sequence in a tiny lift. Bond, of course, wins and tricks Tiffany into thinking... You just killed James Bond. Which does beg the question, if James Bond is so well known amongst these kinds of circles, how in any way, shape or form is he an effective spy? But fine, we'll gloss over that. Bond and Case smuggle the diamonds to America by inserting them into Frank's elementary canal, which is one hell of an obscure gag for a Bond film. You see, the elementary canal is located here on the human body, but elementary sounds like Sherlock Holmes' famous catchphrase, elementary, so I guess it's a gag for any medical graduates who might be watching. I know the diamonds are in the body, but where? Elementary, Dr. Lighter. Um, it's also here that we meet Norman Burton's Felix Leiter in one of the more bland performances of the character, but never mind, we have some awkward comedy to enjoy with Bond and a bunch of gangsters posing as undertakers. The stiff! <coughs> the cease back there. Your brother, Mr. Franks? Bond is taken to a crematorium where the diamonds are due to be passed on. Connery has some very nice moments here, acting, or rather not acting, the bereaved brother, but Bond provides fake diamonds instead, which is lucky because that saves his life after an attempt is made by Wint and Kidd to cremate 007 alive. Is this actually how cremations work, by the way? Like, I didn't think the oven would be, like, right there next to the service room and that they'd actually burn up the coffin, but whatever. Um, Bond does what anyone would do after they were nearly barbecued and heads to Las Vegas. He checks into the White House, a hotel owned by reclusive billionaire Willard White, and proceeds to, well, gamble away quite aimlessly, really, but he does meet this lovely lady, played by Lana Wood. Hi, I'm Plenty. But of course you are. Plenty O'Toole. 
Named after your father, perhaps. Who, of course, ends up in his bedroom before being promptly ejected by the Undertaker thugs from earlier. Exceptionally fine shot. I didn't know there was a pool down there. I find it strange that Plenty has such recognition in the series. I mean, I guess that the name is memorable and Lana Wood is really great, but the character doesn't do much and it's a shame, but I'll expand on that point uh, later on. Bond sleeps with Tiffany in a very oddly edited scene. I mean, I know that we're not exactly going to see Bond and Tiffany in the act, <laughs> as it were, but the fact that we don't cut away to anything else is odd. It's just jump cut and then there they are, they've had the sex and they're just enjoying a post-coital cigarette. I mean, I don't know, actually, a lot of the editing in Diamonds feels very choppy to me. Some scenes end quite abruptly and you just get the sense that there was probably another page of script to it, but they just had to adhere to a certain running time, so out they went. And it's kind of easy to see how they ended up in that place, as while the dialogue is great, the story is quite convoluted, and I think the next few scenes kind of exemplify this. So Tiffany wants Bond to reveal where the real diamonds are stashed, and even suggests that the pair run away with the loot. Bond arranges for Tiffany to pick them up from the Circus Circus Casino, but he's actually in cahoots with Felix, and then there's some kind of sting operation going on, and elephants are winning jackpots, and women are turning into gorillas, and there's this nightmare in polka dots. <laughs> Alright, boys and girls, here we go, everybody! So, after all that madness, Tiffany gets away and passes on the diamonds to the next smuggler. This happens uh, off-screen, before we see her meet with Bond on-screen, at her villa, where Plenty O'Toole is dead in the pool for no good reason at all. There's a line dropped by Bond how Plenty went to Tiffany's looking to confront her and was mistaken for her. However, how she knew where she lived, what she was confronting her about, it's all on the cutting room floor. There are deleted scenes with Tiffany on the DVD that show her sneaking back into Bond's room, seeing Bond and Tiffany at it, and then finding out Tiffany's address. What isn't available is Tiffany showing up and meeting Winton Kidd and then being killed. This sequence always really confused me as a kid because it took me a while to actually realise that it was plenty in the pool. I know that Bond says it, but it, it just was such a disconnect between what Plenty was doing earlier and her involvement in this diamond smuggling plot because there's no reason for her to be involved. They don't give us a reason for her to be involved. And it's such a big plot point. Uh, I mean, I think they should have really found a way of keeping those scenes in the film if they were going to keep this in the film, which they needed to do because it's Tiffany's big turning point moment. Especially as it prompts a big change of character in Tiffany, who, seeing the drowned girl, comes over to Bond's side for the first time to work with the good guys, which she promptly does in one of my other favourite scenes in the movie where she causes a distraction, allowing Bond to board a van heading to a remote research lab. More fun here as Bond plays a dual role and infiltrates the place. I like seeing Bond do things like this, you know, using his wits and conversation to infiltrate rather than gadgets, and there are some nice little bits in here, like him and the other doctor having to rush to get through the door before it closes. It's such a little thing, but there are lots of nice little funny moments like that in this film. Anyway, after some investigating, Bond discovers that the lab, owned by Willard White, is constructing a rather suspicious satellite under the watchful eye of a Mr. Metz, played by Joseph First. After one of my favourite lines in the film, Will you please leave, you irritating man? Bond is rumbled, and in yet another bizarre choice on the filmmaker's part, sneaks onto a film set of the moon. I have no idea what this is supposed to be, if it's a simulation, or part of a bigger scheme, or what, because, like, no one actually goes up in the Diamond Satellite later on. There's none of Blofeld's employees up in space that we know of, so I don't know why this is here, but this is where we're at, folks. This is it. The moon. I especially love this astronaut guy who still simulates low gravity even when trying to apprehend Bond, who hops into a moon buggy, as you do, and we have a chase sequence. Now, I can only assume that this scene was to play for laughs and nothing else because, I mean, the camera work is pretty bland, the stunts lackluster, and the music devoid of any excitement at all. This is not a blood-pumping thrill ride of a chase sequence. It's a shame because, as For Your Eyes Only shows much later, you can put Bond in a silly vehicle and still have some cool, exciting bits of action, but here... 
I don't know, it's like someone had an idea to put Bond in this thing and thought it would be great, but no one else understood or cared, but just went along with it anyway. Bond meets with Tiffany and the pair head back to Vegas, prompting another vehicle chase sequence with a disappointingly wooden American sheriff. There goes that son of a bitch and saboteur. The guy plays it very much as a V1 of Sheriff J.W. Pepper. Heck, if they'd have cast Clifton James in this part here, I mean, he could have had a, we could have had a trilogy of J.W. Pepper Bond films, but this actor just doesn't have the comedic timing or cartoony charisma that we find in the Sheriff in Live and Let Die and The Man with the Golden Gun. The car chase here is also very poor, again due to lazy camera work and lack of exciting edits or music. It just feels so lethargic and it builds to a stunt that they couldn't even film properly. The whole thing is that the car goes in on two wheels and through a narrow alleyway, but they filmed it going in and coming out on different wheels, so there's an insert, which makes no damn sense at all, to explain the goof where the car shifts halfway through this alley. Bond and Tiffany get some R and R on what must be a damned uncomfortable bed before Bond infiltrates Willard White's penthouse. I love Connery in these moments. He's so cool and casual, just stepping out onto the outside of that building. He's awesome here. But upon entering the penthouse, Bond discovers that Willard White isn't even there, but instead it's two Charles Greys. Just a jump to the left. Yes, Blofeld's alive and has been impersonating Willard White using a voice-changing gadget. Bond has a go at killing one of the Blofelds by kicking the cat and seeing which villain it runs to, but how it's filmed, it literally just looks like Bond kicks a cat on Blofeld rather than letting it run to him. I'd love to know how many takes it took of them flinging a cat through the air at Charles Grey to get the shot. Um, though this pussy should be grateful that it wasn't the one that was used in You Only Live Twice. Anyway, of course Bond still didn't kill the right Blofeld as there's more than one cat, but I'd love it if he actually did kill the right Blofeld and this guy's just like some underling, some Blofeld clone who's like, you know, I'm really gonna make the most out of this promotion. Bond is knocked out and passed off to Winton Kid to dispose of by way of pipe robotic thing? Uh, it's very elaborate, but we do get the best Bond rodent conversation of the series. Sorry, Spectre. One of us smells like a tart handkerchief. It's me. Sorry about that, old boy. Q gets some field work in this one as he meets with Bond in Vegas to provide him with his own voice-altering device so that he can call Blofeld and find out where the real Willard White is being hidden. Bond heads to that location with Felix and the CIA in tow, but for some reason decides to enter the house alone and is confronted by two other very memorable uh, elements of this film. Bambi and Thumper. All yours, Bambi. This prompts a really great fight scene as Bond has to do battle with these incredibly athletic and flexible women. It's worth the plot contrivance of Bond going into this villa alone when really it would have just been much easier just to send in the CIA with you know, guns, but whatever. What is disappointing, though, is how Bond overcomes the women. He just holds them underwater. For all the strength and agility they just showed, to say that they can't just, you know, bat away his hand and get out of a pool is quite a pill to swallow. But Willard White, played by Jimmy Dean, is rescued nonetheless, uh, and meanwhile Tiffany and Q piss about at the casino when a white cat is spotted and Tiffany's captured by Blofeld, who is in drag. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. I'm delighted to meet you, Miss Case. I'd so dreaded the prospect of making this tedious journey alone. It's very, 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 very silly, but not exactly out of tone of what the movie has been so far. I think Jill St. John really sells the moment. She's just so astonished and like, what's going on? Uh, that she doesn't even try to get out of the car or resist or anything. She's just so dumbfounded into absolute silence, as I think any of us would be. Bond, Felix, and White head to the research facility to discover that the Diamond Satellite is gone and is being used from outer space to destroy nuclear weapons around the world. 
By the way, during these little vignettes, I love this guy in particular. His expression just goes from like zero to a hundred in a fraction of a second. There's a huge amount of destruction here, but Blofeld's plan never really feels as big or grandiose as it has done in the last three films. He's using lasers to hold the world to ransom and gets away with a lot of destruction, and yet there just isn't a whole lot of impact. Bond and co. discover that Blofeld is using an oil rig off of the coast of Baja as his base of operations, and so Bond is sent alone again to infiltrate while the CIA wait around for a signal to attack. Tiffany Case is sauntering around and at this point has lost her crass bullshiness and is really just a bimbo running around in a bikini. She does have a few good funny moments though when it comes to switching the tapes that are controlling the laser satellite. Tiffany, my dear. We're showing a bit more cheek than usual, aren't we? Connery, too, has some nice moments around this point. Uh, I especially love this bit where he casually nudges a goon so he completely misses shooting a weather balloon that Bond has repurposed as the sign to the CIA to begin an attack. A lot of Blofeld's problems could have been solved by just shooting Bond here, but obviously he does the classic Bond villain thing and has Bond taken away to be killed in a more amusing fashion. And in doing so, Blofeld ultimately seals his own fate. The assault on the oil rig is fine, but it feels like we're missing some good money shots. Indeed, a mistake during the preparation of the scene meant that a load of explosions went off before cameras were rolling, so I suppose that what we get is somewhat watered down from what was originally intended. Speaking about what was originally intended, an earlier version of the screenplay had uh, Bond and Blofeld make it off the oil rig together and end up at uh, a salt mine, um, where there was going to be a big physical fight sequence between the hero and villain, which would ultimately end in Blofeld falling to his death in a salt granulator. Uh, the sequence was ultimately scrapped because of cost of filming and all running time, all these things, so the sequence was never put to film. Um, and of all the scenes to cut, I mean... I would sooner cut any two or three previous action sequences if it meant that we could have had that final confrontation in this film. It's so disappointing that we do not get a, a good showdown between Bond and Blofeld at the end of this film. And everything I read about that salt mine sequence just sounds like, yeah, I mean, fair enough, you had Bond riding behind Blofeld's bathosub on a weather balloon. But aside from that, everything else just sounds so awesome. It's such a shame that that sequence isn't in the film. Especially considering what happened to the character and the next time we see him in this continuity is for your eyes only, where he is ultimately bumped off, but not with much fanfare. This is supposed to be Bond's arch nemesis, and so far on screen we've never seen the hero satisfyingly vanquish the villain for good. But that doesn't mean I can't enjoy one of my favourite Blofeld moments ever. Tell him we surrender! This is not the madness! One more word, Mitch, and I'll have you shot. Get back to your post! Prepare my battle sub immediately. I just love how he's, like, refusing to go down with his own ship and is much more concerned with just making it out alive, and he's so cool and calm as he does it, but all of that is kind of negated by how unsatisfactorily Bond ends the villain in this film, which basically amounts to swinging Blofeld around slowly in his pathetic little submarine while being shouted at. <laughs> Tiffany is on hand to provide a good laugh, at least. The rig is destroyed and Bond and Tiffany head for Britain via cruise ship when, in true Guy Hamilton fashion, the henchmen of the film reappear to have one last pop at Bond. It's a very nice scene, but some quicker, pacier editing would have helped the scene immeasurably. Tiffany just kind of sits around not doing much and some of the camera work is relatively uninspired. Kid is dispatched of in quite a horrific way, while Wint follows, squealing as a bomb is strapped between his legs. And on that note, we end the movie with Bond and Tiffany looking to the stars, wondering how on earth they're gonna get those diamonds back down to Earth. Diamonds are forever. Thus endeth Sean Connery's tenure with Eon Productions as James Bond 007. But did the actor go out on a high in his Diamonds Are Forever a 007 film for the ages? Eh? 
Probably not. In terms of performance, though, Connery seems to be having a lot more fun here than in You Only Live Twice, where he looked downright bored through most of it. He might look a little paunchier and older here, but, you know, he still has that same magic in the part in Diamonds that he did in From Russia With Love and Goldfinger, his two best Bond performances to my mind. So even if Diamonds fails in every other regard, which I believe it does to some people, at least we have another classic Sean Connery Bond performance. For me personally, there's a lot to enjoy here, chief of all the cast. Jill St. John is one of my favourite Bond girls and Tiffany has great spunk and feist. It's a little shame when she turns into a complete bimbo at the end, but even then she gets some good laughs at least. Uh, Lana Wood and Jimmy Dean are fun American characters and bring a lot of charisma to their roles. For the villains, I've already talked about how much I love Charles Grey and Bruce Glover and Putter Smith are a couple of the best hench people in the series and considering how many fantastic hench people there are in this series, that's really saying something. I know that these casting choices aren't to everyone's tastes, uh, especially Grey, who is widely considered to be the worst Blofeld, but I, I just don't share that opinion. Uh, I, ad admittedly though, it is quite jarring when going to this from Majesty's Secret Service. However, for this most recent viewing, I saw the film outside of the chronology of the series, and you know what, I think it holds up pretty well when viewed that way. <laughs> This is not the most well-constructed Pond film, nor the most thrilling, nor does it really have any great big action sequences. The joy of diamonds comes in the dialogue, in individual scenes rather than the whole, in individual performances, and in the humour. As a scene-by-scene -scene experience, there's something to enjoy in almost everything. That being said, the film does have a feel different from most of the Bond films, a sort of cheapness, and as Catching Bullets author Mark O'Connell says, a certain sleaziness. A part of this is down to the setting, no doubt. Vegas is not a terribly glamorous place, and Bond in a casino there, compared to some swanky hotel in the Bahamas or a fancy London club, just doesn't compare. As for the cheapness, well, I mean, Connery's salary probably cost us at least two big budget action sequences, so it was undoubtedly a trade-off, and ultimately it hurts the film as a whole, and I know this one is far from popular amongst the general fandom. But for what it is, it's a fun romp, it's an easy watch, and a great movie for a rainy Sunday afternoon. I have a good time with Diamonds Are Forever, but I do have to be in the right mood for it, admittedly. Diamonds Are Forever was the life raft that the series needed at the right time. Along with The Spy Who Loved Me and Goldeneye, I certainly rank it as one of the films that kept Bond going, um, even if it's certainly not up to the standard of those other two films I just mentioned. Uh, Diamonds was the flotation device the franchise could use to remind the public about what they loved about Bond before taking another dive into the unknown with a brand new Bond in Live and Let Die.